I'm Pastor Bill. I'm filling in for our senior pastor, John, uh, who is on vacation this week with his uh, lovely wife and two children. And the, the third that is coming, <laughs> that's in the, in the oven, as I like to say. Uh, so they're enjoying themselves and they'll be back next week. We are an elder-led church, just so you know that. Um, I am just one of the pastors uh, here at Grace Journey Community Church. And we, sh we do share those responsibilities. We uh, normally go through the books of the Bible. That's, that's, our, that's what we normally do. Uh, we're going through the book of Deuteronomy right now. Uh, and that is true as Pastor John leads that uh, going through Deuteronomy. Uh, whenever I come up, we get a little break. It's going to be a little different. What I do when I'm here is I do topical sermons. And today I'm doing a sermon on 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. And I titled it, Why Do We Need a Church Family? So we're going to be talking about that as we move into that. So I just wanted you to know that. If you would stand for the reading of God's Word, we're going to be reading 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. As I said, you can find it in your pew Bible on page 959. And I also want to let you know, if, you're, if you need to use the Pew Bible, it's a, you know, we use the ESV be, uh, um, translation here. Uh, you're welcome to use that today. If you don't have one, I ask that you uh, take it home. Uh, it's yours. It's a free gift. You know, there's a, you don't have to, you know, leave anything. We want you to have it and we want you to use it. I think it's important to have God's word nearby when you have questions. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the part that lacked it, that they may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Uh, f a few weeks ago, we started a, uh, a Hope Group series and the study is on Love Your Church. There's some books back there. Uh, we have uh, hope groups on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, Tuesday's class is filled. Uh, Thursday still has opening. If you're not part of this, please join one. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed going through this book. I know our hope group is, you know, we're maxed out, 12 people. And um, I think last week, there's been already a couple of weeks that we've had the maximum people show up, all 12. And I can tell you, we're having a great time with this. And I'm going to quote from this, from this book a little bit. I actually used it in my sermon. That's how good it is. And it's been creating a lot of talk and a lot of understanding so far about the church and what it means to be church members and to be involved caring members. So I just wanted to make that you know, aware. And I'm going to reference chapter 4 
a little while later, and you'll see you'll see why. Um, but I'm, I'm telling you, it's been a great study, great great way to get into God's Word, uh, and it's uh, well done. It's from uh, Tony Morita, and it just uh, it's just been an excellent book. So, why do we need to do such a study? We do this study because the idea of church membership has become misunderstood in our generation today. There are a lot of folks in our society that have the wrong concept about church membership. Another reason is that there are more and more people who believe that membership in a local congregation is unnecessary. And I say that's not true. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, it says, Do not forsake the gathering together to worship the Lord. So I don't know how you do that when you don't go to church. But it's certainly much more difficult. Listen to this. Overall, church membership has declined. Gallup asked Americans a battery of questions on their religious attitudes and practices twice each year. The following analysis of the decline in the church membership uh, relies on a three-year total from 1998 to 2000, when the church, members, uh, church membership averaged 69% of the United States. In 2008 to 2010, it averaged 62%. People said they were going to church regularly. And in 2018 to 2020, did it go up or down? Well, it went down, 49%. There has been a seven-point decline in church membership from 79% in 98 and 2000 to 72% now in church membership. Now, the 49%, those are people who say that, you know, they're members. The rate of growth of the, for the population of the United States and in our local community, let's just talk about Orlando. Is Orlando growing? <laughs> yeah, too fast, right? Traffic's horrible. <laughs> it's not getting any better. Uh, and this is normal. I grew up in Miami. Uh, the same thing happened there. You know, they always want to fix the roads after the horses run out of the barn, right? Um, you know, they let it get so bad that they have to fix it because, you know, it's just horrible. And they, instead of just growing together, we, that just doesn't make sense to uh, our government officials. Anyway, so here we are growing in, in the Orlando area, right? And the church isn't. Why? The rate of growth in the population is, goes up, but the, our congregation doesn't go up. And, in, and all churches in Orlando are suffering from those, uh, you know, declines. One of our main problems is that we are failing to connect with a large segment of our population. And one reason for that is because we become weak and in, unconnected in the area that we've lost biblical understanding of what the church is and what church membership is. We join our churches today, a lot of people, expecting them to serve us, to feed us, to care for us. We don't like the hypocrisy, people say, in the church. But what happens? is we fail to see the, those people fail to see the hypocrisy in their own lives. God has intended the church for us, for us to serve, to care for others, to pray for leaders, to learn, to teach, to give, and in some cases, to die for the sake of the gospel. I know that sounds foreign to us here, but it is not foreign in Christianity. We have become ineffective because we have turned the meaning of membership in our church upside down. This morning, we're going to take a journey. And it's a journey designed to discover the privilege and joy of church membership. It's also a journey that will lead us into a better church health. If even one of our members becomes healthier, there will be a greater impact in our community and maybe even across the world. Our first step in the journey is for us to understand this. Why do we need a church family? Why? What does that mean? How does it play out in our lives and the life of our congregation? So the first point I want to make is church membership means we are all necessary parts of the whole. There are several passages in the New Testament that deal with the idea of church membership. Like Hebrews, and I quoted that earlier, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, not to forsake the assembling together to worship the Lord. You, you got to come to do that. You got to be here. 
But the longest and most detailed passage is found in, guess what? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 of Paul's first letter to the church of Corinth. And, you know, in chapter 12, he uses a symbolic language, didn't he? That I read to you, a lot of symbolic language. But hopefully we're gonna, we get the idea from that and we're going to dig in deeper as to what he's trying to tell us. In chapter 13, he defines what should drive church membership. And then in chapter 14, he covers some issues regarding the corporate worship time in the church, which I already kind of mentioned in Hebrews. But he also goes into that much deeper. So when you leave here today, I would love for you to, to go and read chapter 13 and 14. Spend a little time to get that whole picture that Paul was going to do. I'd love to do it today, but I'd have to keep you late, and I know you wouldn't appreciate that. So I'll, I'll, we'll just stick with uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 12 through 27. Some church leaders and members view membership as a modern business or organization concept. Membership is not that, it's biblical. A little later in verse 27, Paul says this, Now you are the body of Christ. Listen to me, the pronoun you, in this plural form, in the original language, it's a first century Greek translation version, and I will say this, and you all can relate to that, and that is that, the southern slang saying you all. That's what it meant. When, the, when he says you are the body, you all are the body of Christ. The concept that each person joins together to make up the church, the church body. When the New Testament talks about the church, it uses two closely related, yet significantly different ideas. There is the church universal, everywhere. And what else is there? But there's also the church local. The individual congregations that make up the worldwide body of Christ. It's all the little locals that make up the big picture. In the first century church, when you became a Christian, you became a member of not only the church universal, but also that local church. The church is the most effect is more, most effective at the local level. Doesn't that make sense? That's why we're part of the Southern Baptist Association that helps us to reach the world. And we give to that. That's our part. To help, to reach out to the universal church. That through those ways, what, what happens is we, we, give, we begin ministry efforts and we start new congregations you know, in different areas, just as Paul was talking about here throughout Rome, the Roman Empire. Local leadership has, is, uh, is put into place to shepherd, to teach the members of the local congregation re regarding the ways of discipleship. And that's what our principles are, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The early Christians were called to practice the one another's. All right, one another's. Listen, I told you I was going to refer to this. I really love this. Uh, in chapter 4 of our book, didn't mark it because I didn't bring mine, but here it is. In chapter 4, in the caring chapter, in chapter 4 here, it's called caring of, of this hope group study. He talks about this. And, and let me tell you, he quotes, I think it was, I think it's 23 of them that he quotes in here one another passages. What do I mean by one another passages? Listen to some of the ones that I highlighted. Serve one another. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Love for one another. Seek to do good to one another. Comfort one another. Bear one another's burdens. And so on and so on and so on. Every one of our people in our group had different things highlighted as their the, the main things that touched them out of these 23 that were in this Hope Group study. Why? Because different things touch each one of us differently. Just like I'm going to go into, you know, the hand reacts different than the foot, and the foot reacts different than the eyes, and the eyes react different than the ears. Because we're all different parts. So different things, you know, jump out at us as to these one another's that strike us as important one another's for us. 
But I think you understand what it's talking about. These one another passages in the New Testament demonstrates the importance of caring for your brothers and sisters and your Christian community and your Christian church, local and universal. I thought that was a wonderful part. Just one, that was just one chapter. They've all been good so far. But what happens? For many of us, the list that I just talked about and all those other ones that I didn't, because there's 23 of them, contain nothing new to us. We kind of know them, most of us. We know those things that we, that we should care about. The question is today, do we do them? Members comprise the whole and are essential parts of it. In verse 14, we're told this, even so, the body is not made up one part, but of many. Wow. You see that? He's telling us exactly that. The whole cannot be complete without the individual members. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. The church is a body. The, our church is a body. Look at it like that. I think it's important for us to see it like that. Paul uses a physical body as a representation of the church. He says that God has put his body together according to both a plan, a purpose, just like our physical bodies. Just like our physical bodies. That's why he used the physical body to demonstrate how the church also is to function and what it's to look like. In, 18, in, Paul, in, in verse 18, Paul says this, But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Right? You ever, you ever thought about the body? How it's constructed together? How it works together? It's, uh, it's something to behold. David says in Psalms 139, 13, and 14, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. The human body is amazing. It's an amazing piece of work. Truthfully, how can anyone ever believe that, it, it, that our bodies, the way they function, are a product of time and chance. I like to put it this way. I know Yvette's used to see, hearing this. All this came from primeval ooze. That's what people believe. It all started as primeval ooze and somehow a body like ours that works the way it does and so many other things in the world by chance. Listen to some facts that you may not know. Do you know the stomach digestive acids are strong enough to dissolve zinc? Fortunately for us, the cells in the stomach lining, those linings on your stomach wall release several enzymes and mucus. This mucus is virtually and vitally important to the process. It protects the lining of the stomach so the acid and other gastric juices don't eat through it. Small thing, one might think, but pretty cool, isn't it? Do you know your lungs contain over 300,000 million capillaries? Those are the tiny blood vessels. And if you were to lay them end to end, they would stretch 1,500 miles. Did you know human bone is strong enough? It is strong as, it is strong as granite in supporting weight. A block of bone the size of a matchbox can support nine tons of weight. That is four times as much as concrete can support. Each kidney contains one million individual filters. They filter an average of around 2.2 pints of blood per minute. That's right, per minute. And they expel up to 2.5 pints of urine a day. The muscles in your eye that cause you to focus and move your eyes around 
They go 100,000 times a day on the average. To give your leg muscle the same workout, I want to relate this now, as hard as those eyes are working to do all those things, to have the same effect of your legs, guess what? Would you, how many miles you'd have to walk every day to equal what your eyes are doing? 50. 50 miles. If I, I couldn't walk five miles, I don't think. <laughs> so, that's a, that's a, isn't that incredible? God has designed the church as a body as well. He has designed it and set it in order. It is set up so that each individual member must, let me say that again, must do their part for the body or the church, the body of the church. Doesn't operate, it, you know, I mean the church has to, it, it, if it wouldn't operate properly if we don't do it that way. It doesn't operate as the way it was intended when we don't function together. When that hand says, like it says here, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, or I like better before when it says the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. <laughs> I don't need you. Well, let's look into that. Church membership means, the second point, that we are different but still have to work together. 1 Corinthians 12, 15 through 21, 27 says this, If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, what would not make it less, you know, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body, would it? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body was an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose, as he designed. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. There is both unity and diversity in this. The parts of the body must work together for the health of the body. Imagine with me for a minute, if your brain received a, a message and the message said, you're thirsty. Your eye sees the bottle of water across the room. However, your feet and legs decide they're not gonna transport you. They say, we're not gonna cooperate. What would happen then? If so, there would, if that happened, what would happen? There'd be no drink. You're not gonna get it. Even if you could get your legs and your feet to cooperate in the endeavor, what would happen if your hands at that point, when you walked over to it, to grasp the bottle of and your hands said, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna cooperate. Or if your hand picked up the bottle, and your other hand said, no, I'm not gonna twist that cap off. And then if you did convince your hand to twist the cap off, and then you brought it to your mouth and your mouth said, mm-mm. I'm not gonna open up. Can you imagine? Then you would, you would not receive the water. And if you didn't receive the water, it wouldn't do the body any good. And we know when, without enough water, your body suffers as a whole. Each part must do its work for the whole body or the whole body suffers. If one part of the body doesn't do its job, the body doesn't function well. But if one part of the body does its job well and the rest of the body benefits, Paul says in verse 26, he says this, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, Every part rejoices with it. Listen, if you need water, and we need water to survive, it's pretty important to us. We can go a lot longer without food than we can without water, right? So it's important to get that water, and it's important for all the parts of our body to work together to get that. 
So in getting that, we would all rejoice together because that would nourish all the body. So everybody benefits. So my third point is this. Church membership is functioning membership. In many cases, we have been following the wrong model for church membership. We have adopted the country club membership model instead of the Church of Christ model. The country club model offers perks and privileges. It says, come and be entertained and served. The country club model, when implemented in the church, says things like this. And I've encountered some of these in my 21 years of ministry. How about a person who says, I write a nice check to the church on a regular basis. If you don't do things my way, then I won't give my money. Or I've been a member of this church for over a blank number of years, you can fill in the blank, and I have the right to, to have things go the way I want them to go. Or a preacher, they'll say, you need to come around to my way of thinking or I will find another church. We must follow the biblical model instead of the country club model. The biblical model says this, go and be a blessing and serve others according to Christ's example. It says this, God has designed the church for a purpose and we will follow that purpose. One is selfish and the other is sacrificial. Right? Can you see the difference? The, the, on the one hand, people are, 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 are saying, it's, you know, it's all about me. You know, I did this, I do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. No, it's Christ. Christ is the center. We have to be willing to give, to sacrifice. Someone has described the church that follows the country club model as a sports arena. And I love this analogy. I, I see this all the time. The, the, the multitudes are in the stands, right? Football season's in the back. Uh, whether you're a football fan or any other sports fan, I'll use football because that's my favorite sport, uh, even though my team is horrible. But <laughs> that's the Miami Dolphins, by the way. But, um, but all these people in the stands are cheering for the team, right? Or booing for the team, or just, or, or, or that. You ever hear people say, that's my team? And I always wanna say, well, it might be the team that you're rooting for, but that's not your team. The guys on the field playing the game, those are the, that's their team. It's, it's not the spectator team. It's not their team. They're just rooting for a team. They don't do any of the work. They don't do any of those things. But yet, they're actually out there telling people, you know, you heard the slang, the Monday morning quarterback. So Monday morning after the game, whether they lost or won, but usually after they lost, they're gonna tell you all the things you did wrong at your team. They're gonna point out everything you did wrong and, and how you could have done it better. In the meantime, they're not the ones out there, you know, working hard five, six, seven days a week to make those things happen or to change the things that are wrong to make them better. They're spectators. And spectating is not a sport or shouldn't be. And that's what even happens in our churches. We have spectators. In the biblical model, everyone has a function. See, all those people in the stands, those 70, 80, 90,000 people in the stands, they don't have any, any function other than to cheer their team, to yell and scream, or to boo, whatever it is. That's their only function. But here at the church, it's different. Because God's picture of the church, you know, has given, was, as it was given to the apostle, wasn't like that, was it? Each one of the parts is supposed to fulfill a role. The foot's function is to walk. The hand's function is to grasp and to hold. The ear's function is to hear. The nose function is to smell. The concept of the inactive church member in a, is an oxymoron. An oxymoron is when two ideas expressed together seem totally incompatible and inconsistent with each other. 
Biblically, such a church member, I mean, biblically, no such church member exists. We are a body and we are all parts, you know, that work together. We are, we are united towards one goal and one purpose. You know, a lot of churches keep a record of what they deem are active or inactive members. The definitions vary from congregation to congregation. We'll call them members and regular attenders. In some churches, you can remain on the membership rolls for, without ever showing up or giving anything to the works of the church. And you know, in other congregations, you're considered an active member if you're even if you're a CEO. You know what a CEO is? I call them CEOs. Christmas and Easter only. It's the only time they show up for church. You're considered an active member, you know, when you do that for some churches. In some congregations, you are, you are, you know, you're a member, you know, just because you give a large sum of money without ever lifting a finger in service or even coming to church. But because you give, you're a member. That kind of membership is not biblical membership. It is self-engineered, self-centered, self-maintained. It has no place in a church. That's why we here at Grace Journey Community Church have an annual re-sign-up commitment for membership each and every year. The biblical member of the church is someone who gives abundantly and serves without hesitation to the best of their ability. Biblical membership gives without qualifications. Don't give and say blank, blank, blank. I, this is what has to happen with the money that I give that you have destinations or qualifications. It views tithes and offerings as a joyous giving with no strings attached. Biblical church membership serves and ministers as a natural way of doing things. And they do it all based on the foundation of selfless, let me say that again, selfless love. The most pressing question is, how can you best serve your church? And that is so vital. How can you serve your church? I would ask today that we take a pledge. A pledge to be different. We would be making a pledge to be members the way the biblical model teaches it. The way Paul just taught us here in this wonderful passage. That's the way God designed it. We would be pledging to be a functional church members. So I wanna ask you if you'll consider this pledge. And here it is, 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. Listen, that's the pledge. For just that we have to say to ourselves, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So that's the way it is. It means that you are the body of Christ, individually members of it, and because I am a member of the body of Christ, I must be a functional member. I will give, I will serve, I will minister, I will evangelize, I will study, I will pray, I will seek to be a blessing to others. I will remember that. If any member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Isn't that wonderful? I've often said to people, uh, that don't go to church, don't, some of them don't believe, I often say to them, how do you get through the difficult times? Because they're going to come. I guarantee it. They're going to come. Difficult times are going to come upon you. Whether it be physical, mental, financial, difficult times are coming. I did a sermon on the, st the storms of our lives quite a while ago. And I, t and I said then, you know, life is, is like hills and valleys, storms that come across. 
And, and as those storms come across, they can be pretty bad. Some are worse than others. But I'm telling you, if you're not in the midst of a storm right now, guess what? One's coming. If one just ended for you and you're feeling pretty good, again, don't relax too long because another one's coming. Because that's just the way life is. I don't know how people get through church without their church family. You know, when Yvette got cancer, and we had to go through that. I am so grateful I had my church family to walk through that with us. Because without the church family, I don't know how people do it. I really don't. Sure, I have some other friends and family, you know, aside that try and help, but not like the church does. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. Because the church family was praying for us, praying with us. And I am grateful for that. And it makes it even more real what I say to you today, that without that church body, we wouldn't have gone through it as easily as we did. And it wasn't easy. Because all the parts of the body were working together. And as all those parts of the body work together to help us to walk through those difficult times. Listen to me. Christ purchased the church with his blood. The church does not belong to the pastor, elders, or deacons. It doesn't belong to the church members with the longest seniority or who give the most. It belongs to Christ. He is the head of the body. So how will this scripture today change your life? into living and loving one another and the church. I say it will by remembering this. It's the title of my sermon. You need a church family. If you don't realize it right now, you need a church family. When you're grieving the loss of somebody, all right, here's where you'll find not only here today, being part of the church, family here, but having that church family around you, you know, that cares for you, that's concerned for you. It means first, that we are all necessary parts of the whole. See, each one of us, remember what I said, the hand can't say, or the legs can't say to the head and the eyes, we need some water. The legs can't say, no, I'm not going. The hand can't say, even if you walk over there, I'm not going to pick it up. You can't do that. We've got to work together. Second, it means that we are different, but we still work together. Listen, each one of us have different backgrounds, different upbringings, different phases in our lives. But that doesn't mean we can't work together to accomplish God's goals. And third, church membership is functioning membership. We gotta make it work. The hands, the feet have to walk. The hand has to pick up the bottle. The mouth has to open up and drink the water. We have to do it together. The true church is made up of those people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they are committed to him, and he is committed to them. How about you? It is only through the shed blood of Jesus that we can be truly free. I've shared this story before, and I always repeat it when, I, when the Lord has put it on my heart. But as he, you know, I, I didn't get saved until I was 45 years old. Most of you know that, but if you don't. And um, I got saved because somebody invited me to church. Yvette did. Uh, my wife. And I, I share this because it was true. When I stood at the door, I told her I would think about it. 
and I stood at the do front door. She already went, and I decided, you know, she really wanted me to go, and it meant a lot to her, and I love Yvette to death, so I said, okay, I'll go. So as I stood at the front door, much like those there, and I was ready to walk in, I really, really thought that I might spontaneously combust because I wasn't a good guy and I didn't live a good life. I lived life, a selfish life, to be honest with you. And um, I knew that if God was a good God, I deserved punishment, really. Anyway, when I walked into the church, guess what happened? First, I didn't spontaneously combust, which was a big relief to me. The second part was that I found a group of people in that church that loved God and loved me and could care less how long I've been saved, if I was saved, what I had done, didn't care. Just love. Just loved me and taught me the Bible. And as I learned more and more about the Bible, I accepted Christ. And I stand before you today, the end result of that first step into God's kingdom. But it's only through his shed blood that we can find, we can be that truly free. So take some time and think to yourself and all, about all you have and get down on your knees and give Jesus Christ thanks, praise, and glory for it. See, that's something that was missing in my life. And it's, a lot of times it's something missing in our, all our lives that we don't take the time to get down on our knees and give Jesus Christ for the people that he's put in our lives, for the caring church he may have put in your path to help you along your journey and to continue your journey if you're here today. And to be thankful for those people and to really get down on your hands and knees and praise him and be thankful that those people are in your life that care that much about you, that they're willing to ask you to go to church or, or you know, read the Bible to you or witness to you or whatever it is that got you here, your own faith story. So if you're here this morning and you don't know who Jesus Christ is as your personal Savior and Lord, you need to pick up the cross. That is what Jesus said in John 14, 6. This is what John, this is what, listen, this is, <laughs> this is what Christ said. Now John's repeating Christ's words. In your Bible, if you, you know, when you read it, if you have the uh, colored version, you know, Jesus Christ's words are always in red. And here's what it says in the red section there. Because people get mad at me sometimes when I say this. And I always tell people, don't get mad at me. I didn't say it. I'm just telling you what this, what this says, what God said. And this is what God said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Bill doesn't say that. You don't say that. You're quoting what the Bible says. And you're doing right. And if you are willing to let go of the world and surrendering your heart to Jesus Christ, then what you need to do is you need to confess your faith to him. And you know what? This is a simple thing. In Romans 10, 9 through 10, it says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say you have to be Catholic. It doesn't say you have to be a Mormon. It doesn't say you have to be a Jehovah Witness. It doesn't say you have to be a Baptist. It's what it says right there. Anybody who adds to God's word or subtracts, or subtracts from God's word is a liar. You will be saved. It says in, in verse 10, for, what the heart, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Period. We are saved by grace, not by works. I didn't do anything to acquire my salvation. All I did is surrender and believe and confess with my mouth. And that's all you have to do. Remember, remember this. If you walk away with nothing else, and I think this is worthy to say to other people, they don't, they don't want to hear it, but here's God's truth. Remember, this world is temporary, but heaven and hell, they're forever. 
And that's what we should be living for forever. We are going to live forever. It's just a matter of where. Well, let's pray. Lord, Father, I thank you, Lord, today for the symbolism that, that we get from your word that Paul wrote to us about how important the individual parts of the body are, but not only individually, but collectively. That's the most important part that you're teaching us here today, Lord, that collectively we can do enormous things if we would just love each other and work together, cooperate. Lord, your will will be done. And Lord, you love your church and you want to see your church grow. Lord, I pray that we would have that heart, that we would realize that the hand is just as important as the foot and, and you know, and just as important as the eyes and the ears and the nose and, you know, and the hair, although I'm losing quite a bit of it. Lord, it's all important because you put us together according to your plan. Lord, I pray that anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord, would, love, would, would turn, Lord, to you to recognize that they're lost. <coughs> and Lord, that they need you as their Savior. Lord, I pray for the love of each and every one that's here today, Lord, that would be poured out, Lord, not only to their friends and family, to us each other, towards each other, but Lord, to the community at large that they would see that there's something going on at Grace Journey Community Church. And Lord, as we move forward in the plans for Great Journey, Grace Journey Community Church, that you would just, Lord, just continue to bless it and bless those within the walls that are working together to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray.